been going down the side road of the sovereignty of God after we've gotten through that first chapter of Peter's first letter. <clears throat> Peter's first letter is so full of doctrine that one doctrine that we need to be fully conversant in understanding is that that God is sovereign, that God is in charge of everything. And so we saw in the first week that God accepts us, God has a plan for us. The week after that, we saw that God acts, he sustains, he plans, he creates. Last week we discussed the fact that if God is in charge, then we're not. And that's one of the struggles we have is giving up our autonomy to a sovereign God. But this weekend, we're going to be looking at is if God is in charge, then I'm responsible to him. There was a time in my life when I had real problem with authority. To the point that I even got mad at stop signs. I did not want to stop. <clears throat> Sally and I have horses, if you haven't heard. And one of the problems we have in horse training is horses don't like to be obedient to someone. And so part of the training program is that we have to prove to them we're worthy to be their boss. And Sally's been, if you haven't heard, she got this little pup over a year ago. And that's another guy who's had trouble submitting to someone being in charge. And he's much better now than he was little, but you know, you'd go to rub him and he'd growl as a little puppy. And sometimes you can see that in his countenance, sly, heel. And, and that's how I feel sometimes. It just, I don't wanna be obedient. I just wanna rail against the goals, so to speak. Yeah, and that's the point. Submission to authority is a problem with almost everyone I know. But for the Christian, submission to an authority is not an option. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, and be subject to one, on a, one another in the fear of Christ. The writer of Hebrews wrote, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Again, Paul writes in Ephesians, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Nobody's throwing anything at me. <laughs> children, children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. To the Romans, Paul wrote, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. And then Peter, late, later in Peter's study, we'll learn, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. And then again in Peter, it says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. So we are to be subject to others. But the Bible teaches that the most important act of submission and most important act of obedience is to a sovereign God. James wrote in chapter four, submit therefore to God. In 1 Samuel, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as inequity and idolatry. The writer of Ecclesiastes wrote in chapter 12, the conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. And in Deuteronomy, you shall walk in all the way in which the Lord your God has commanded you. 
So the Bible is pretty clear. We're to submit to the authorities, but ultimately we are to submit to God and to be obedient. So if God is in charge of everything, then we're responsible to him. Last week we talked about autonomy. We just mentioned it. We have this problem. If God's in charge, it means I'm not. And that's one of the struggles that many of us have. However, responsibility to God is not that bad of a deal. The Christian life can be likened to a minefield. And only a fool would want to walk across a minefield without some sort of guidance. Obedience to God is that guide to take us across a minefield. <clears throat> so, what else does the Bible have to say about obedience? The first thing is that obedience is not an option. Jeremiah 7.23, but this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in all the way which I command you, that it may be well with you. And then Jesus, later as he was speaking, some came up to him to claim him as Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not say or do not do what I say? And that was in Luke chapter six. God doesn't request obedience, but He demands it. Second point is God gives us guidance. God gives us guidance for us to obey. We're not called to be obedient in a vacuum. There's some married guys in here. Has your wife ever been mad at you and you have no understanding why? No idea why she's upset? It, it might even be that you did something in her dream last night and, and you're supposed to know that. And so everybody believes that God's will is a mystery, that, it, that we're in a vacuum and we're just supposed to go along and hope that we're performing God's will. Well, that's not the fact. It's... He does not keep his will from us. When the enemies of Jesus question him whether his authority came from God or not, his reply was written in John, if anyone is willing to do his will, to do his will, he will know of the teaching whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Now the second prerequisite to obedience is knowledge but the first prerequisite to obedience is the desire you may know what it means to be obey you may know what's in the bible to obey but if you don't have the desire to obey it doesn't matter what's in here you have to have that desire to obey first and if your heart is not willing to obey it's a good bet we'll never know what his will is so the question is what is God's will? I heard a pastor tell a story that one of his parishioners came up to him after church one day and said, Pastor, I need your help in discerning God's will. And he made an appointment and, and they met in his office a few days later and they sat down and the pastor said, okay, so what's this going on here? Well, look, pastor, I really need to discern God's will in the situation I'm in. I've taken a mistress and I love her, but I also love my, life, my wife. And, you know, the guy didn't look in the Bible. It's obvious what God's will in that situation is. So what is God's will? Is it that we obey the Ten Commandments? That we pray a lot? That we memorize scripture or that we witness? The Bible tells us, Paul writes to, in, to the church of Thessalonica, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. God's desire is that we come closer to him. We become sanctified and more like him as we draw near him. God is more interested in where our heart is, that means set apart for him, than he is in our actions. 
So how is it that we find his will? The first one is, well, we look at the Bible, and that's why I'm playing these videos to motivate you guys to open this Bible every day and read. Secondly, through human institutions like the church. Thirdly, we find his will through fellow believers. And sometimes even we find his will through circumstances. So obedience is not an option. God will give us guidance for obedience. The third thing to understand is obedience to God is not here to make us miserable. It's an unbiblical view to believe that God wants or says no to everything good, beautiful, and fun, and demand that everything we do be unpleasant. God has rules for us for our own good. There's a guy named Manfred Gutsky, lived from 1896-1993. He was a professor at Columbia Theological Seminary. And Manford said this, if you want to be reasonably happy and healthy, then you must do what people have done throughout history, obey God's law. Those laws are the laws of the universe, and we must remember that God has given them to us to help us, not hurt us. To obey God's law is to live the way we are intended to live in a difficult world. When Jesus said that he had not come to do away with the law, he meant exactly that. He came to give us the power to live the law and to give us forgiveness when we failed. Fourthly, obedience to God makes us free. That doesn't sound right, does it? But if, if we are not obedient to God, then we are slaves to sin. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You remember the Sanford and Sons, Aunt Edna and Ethna? The truth will set you free. Bonhoeffer said, if you set out to seek freedom, then learn above all things to govern your soul and your senses. Only then through discipline may a man learn to be free. Boy, discipline and freedom generally don't go in the same sentences together. You don't think about discipline and freedom together. But an example, I'm not free to play the piano unless I submit myself to the discipline of the laws of playing the piano. And that is what Louise has done. She is disciplined, right? You've practiced. All these years, you practiced to be able to play the piano. And there was discipline in that. And she's free to play the piano now. Whereas I'm not disciplined in the laws of piano, so I don't play the piano. So once I become obedient to the task, I'm then free to perform it. When a Christian cooperates with the God who created him, at that moment, the Christian becomes free in a new way. Jesus, by his grace, makes us free to be obedient and righteous. And fifthly, Christians aren't called to be obedient out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of guilt. Well, I got saved, so I suppose I better go to church. It's not. Paul writes to the Corinthians, for the love of Christ controls us. The motivation is that when we see in our minds that man upon the cross, that he did that for me, that he did that for each one of you, that is our motivation. Christians are not called to be obedient by themselves. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Obedience is a gift. 
One way to fail this Christian life is to say this, I will be obedient if it kills me. And generally it does. In John's gospel, Jesus is quoted, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This helper is the Holy Spirit that comes alongside when we invite Christ in we submit ourselves to his lordship, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us at that point. It's said that the Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. It's only been lived successfully by one human, and that is Jesus. And he lives with us, he walks with us to make this life possible. There's this myth, and I heard it, and I always thought it was from the Bible, God helps those who help themselves, and it's not. What's true is God helps those who know they can't help themselves and know it. So then, if God is in charge, we're ultimately responsible to him. In the end, he'll not ask us how many times we've prayed, how many people we've witnessed to, how much money we've given, how many times we've been to church. He'll ask you, did you do what I told you to do? If you remember, in our study of Mark last year, Jesus had gone through a series of confrontations while he was in the temple that last week of his life. And one of the scribes came up to him and asked him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus answered, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. What a challenge. What a challenge to love somebody so completely that we've never touched. That we've never seen. I mean, there's times when we're married, to be truthful, that we've got to go to the other ends of the house. We'll come together later when we cool off, but we'll go to the other end of the house. It's tough enough to love somebody that we can touch and hold and cry with. How hard it is to love God. How hard it is to love Christ the way he were commanded to with all our heart, all our strength, all our soul. So one of the commandments that Jesus has given us and there's two sacraments commanded in the Bible. The first one is baptism, and the second one is the Lord's Supper, communion. And Paul writes to the, first, to the, to the Corinthians in chapter 11. He's telling them, and the church at Corinth had a problem with this Lord's Supper. They were showing up and thinking it was a banquet. And the rich ones would come early and they'd start drinking the wine and eating and getting their full and, and in partying. When in fact, there's a time when we're sharing the cup, sharing the bread with Christ himself. So Paul writes, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. So we've had some practice in the last few years of going through this liturgy within the hymnal. It's been up on the screen, but it's from the hymnal. 
religious words and religious motions. And so we sometimes become desensitized to the true meaning, the solemnity of the Lord's Supper. What we're doing is dining with Christ. He's invited us to his table. It's not just a matter of memorializing this activity. It's more than that. But one of the things we do count on or rely on within our belief of being within the kingdom of heaven is that of repent and believe. I've not said anything so far about a season of Lent. And that's because from our study of Mark, Jesus was most critical of those religious activities, those apostate religious activities that didn't do anything to bring anyone closer to Christ. And Lent was a, is a Catholic practice adopted by Methodists in the 50s or 60s so they could be like their Catholic neighbors. And so that's why I've not gone down that route. And the other idea is that during Lent and Advent is supposed to be a season of repentance. Well, the Bible tells us that we're to repent and believe and that's not a one and done deal. It's tough to believe in a God we don't see and hear and touch. And it's tough to just go from twice a year to repent. It's a daily thing that we need to repent. And, turn, and basically repentance is saying, God, you're right. We're submitting to the sovereignty of God in our lives when we repent. And so that's on tape. And when it gets on YouTube, I'll probably not be a pastor next year. Who knows? <laughs> um, but at any rate, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And one thing that I do believe is fitting for this is this prayer of repentance that we have within our hymnal. And this is one that we repeat, and, and it makes sense. Let's read together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We've not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy.